Um, one thing that is different is instead of waiting for, I usually go last so everybody has a chance, but tonight, uh, even though we have a lot of people, I'm going to go first because uh, for many of us, it's a little special and important. Uh, some of you who are regulars here may know that my dear friend Peter Fox Smith is usually one of our regulars. And some stuff has been going on which uh, comes into all our lives. I spoke to Peter on the phone. He is not able to come tonight, obviously. And I've asked him if he wouldn't mind if I read some of his writings to you. Uh, he has, as many of you may know or don't, a wonderful, whimsical book he's written, which, do we have this in the library? I think we must. I think we do, actually. Okay. Uh, a potpourri of remembrances, poems, anecdotes, and drawings. A piddle-doodle memoir of fact and fantasy. And they're wonderful little tales of stuff he knows about all his, uh, from all of his years on the radio and his deep knowledge of classical music. So I've gone through this, haven't had a lot of time, but I've tried to pick out a few things that I think lend themselves to being entertaining and uh, accessible. So I'm going to start with that before I do. Anything else? Meg, I forgot, in terms of the usual stuff. One thing it is academic, but I really believe in, is whoever comes up here, we give them your name, and you all get some applause. Instead of that usual poetic feeling of, you know, deep solitude where nobody says anything and the precious words hang in the air. Uh, and take the time you think. If it goes too long, we'll let you know. And it's very supportive atmosphere which cannot be legislated, but you'll feel it or you won't. So, this is from Peter's book. What have I written here? Uh, many of them are critical. He was a critic. He knows music in a wonderful, wonderful, very deep way. His passions, as Peter would tell you, are music and poetry. So I've picked out some whimsical, humorous, occasionally politically incorrect, iconic writings, notes, and anecdotes, etc. Um, I'll try and do them some justice, though, of course, you really need to hear, and hopefully you will later, Peter's own inimitable voice uh, in the future. So, with that in mind... This is the book. It's probably in the library. And let's just start with a little memo he wrote to James Levine. Some of you familiar with that name? Okay. A, quite a well-known uh, artistic director with the Met for a long time. So this is one of the entries from here, from Peter. Dated March 10th, 2000, Memo. To James Levine, Artistic Director of the Metropolitan Opera, from Peter Fox Smith, Producer, Saturday Afternoon at the Opera on VPR. Regarding the Met Singers. Jimmy. You built the Met Orchestra into as fine an opera ensemble as there is in the world. And the choruses, children and adult, both are superb. So why do you continue to tolerate mediocre, even bad singing? This is certainly not my first mentioning of this to you. 
with too many billions of people bumping into each other everywhere and knocking each other off the face of the earth, there must be a few out there who can sing. And there are. I have heard them in Europe, so hire them. We who listen to the radio can turn it off when the singing gets bad. But what about all the poor bums who separate themselves from gold for a ticket? I know your ears are not made of tin, Jim, so get with it. It's a bad legacy and you are running out of time. Also, the intermission cast of characters gets weaker and weaker. They, too, have got to go, but I know this is not your department. I'll take you to lunch after the season, and we can talk some more, Peter. So that's James Levine. Then he has a little something on a quite a familiar character. Many of us know in one way or the other. Sir John Falstaff. This huge, fat, egotistical, and almost old man were certain other men's wives were anxiously waiting to lie beneath his ponderous, writhing bulk. Shakespeare created him. Boito and Verdi made him immortal in their incomparable masterpiece, Falstaff. So ten years ago or so, while leading one of my opera tours to Europe, I took our group to a production of Verdi's Falstaff that the brainless tour manager had promised us all to be an excellent traditional production. Thereafter, I learned this man could be trusted only to lie as long as it put pennies in his pocket. It was a horrible production. A total mishmash of scenes representing no time in particular, but rather a goulash of 600 years unreasonably blended into a meaningless slop, slosh, and sludge of cutesy pie scenes that had nothing to do with anybody in any place at any time. But of course, this is the irrelevant extreme that modern operas, producers go to individualize themselves as another idiot among idiots committed to the ruination of opera. As you can tell, Peter had very specific uh, feelings about what music should be. Don't go to productions that do not honor the intentions of the composer, which almost always are made clear beyond any room for distortion. Don't go, I tell you, don't go. Leave the house with empty seats, and producers will come back to doing the job they were meant to do. And finally, I do love Falstaff. I'm old and have my ailments. So the next dude that takes it upon himself or herself to fuck up Falstaff may find their head blown to bits. Would not my last days in prison with headphones and historic opera recordings be worth it? Then we go to the feelings he had and some stuff he sent to a fairly well-known singer, if I can find it, named Luciano. Who do you think? Oh. April 21st, 2000. This is a letter that Peter wrote to Dear Luciano. There's a real things he wrote, they're not just made up. Oh, dear me. You should have stopped singing when I told you to. Your last Radames was sad to hear. A real disaster after all those wondrous years 
of your big, round, warm, happy peasant tones. But always with you, it was to excess. Too much pasta, too much vino, and now when you run off with a woman half your age and a third your size, what do you expect? Melchior said, regard your voice as capital in the bank. When you go to sing, do not draw on your bank account. Sing on your interest, and your voice will last. You should have listened. It's not that you didn't do well. After all, you're almost as old as I am, and you are still at it. But you should have stopped at the top and not on the way down. And Peter goes on and says, but who am I, Luciano, to give you advice? If you were to sing of all the times I have screwed up, it would be a very long song. <laughs> See you soon, Peter. So we go from these longer critical ones to end up with a few shorties that are rather politically incorrect, of course, no Peter, uh, yet pleasantly whimsical uh, to or about Vincenzo Bellini, another lovely operatic composer of Norma and such. So Peter says, a Catania composer named Bellini, Macy, had an exceedingly active, you know where this is going, weenie. For each opera he made, the prima donna he laid, until both were quite tutto fine. And then he goes to a marvelous modern composer who back in the day ruffled too many feathers. A man named Dimitri. Who do you think he is talking about? Shasi, baby. Shostakovich. So he writes, there's no doubt that D. Shostakovich was an ingenious son of a bitch. Yet his opera, The Nose, Stupid Stalin did oppose as a dumb story with music way off pitch. So let's close with Leos. Who do you think? Janoshek. What does he say? Another impropriety, so for those of you who don't feature it, shut your ears. Some deem it, indeed, quite gauche, that old married Janacek Leosh did relentlessly pursue until Camilla would screw. And she barely 28 when she did finally copulate and married too, while Laosh was over 62. Beneath mounds of covers, this odd aged pair of lovers kissed and caressed. You can imagine the rest. Knowing no better way to die he stared death down in the eye. So hail to the persistent old man who makes love as long as he can. If you're hearing it, thank you, Peter. And thanks, everyone, for listening. So who feels like 
Okay. I've, I've appointed Ann to go next. Well, okay? I have the list, so I'll do the next reading. You're here at control, so far be it from me. Whatever you say, Brett. Yes, sir. So we have, and let's have her name so we can give her a hand. Oh. Ann McKenna. <laughs> Ann McKenna. Thanks, it's nice to be here. Um, so I have five short poems, so not to worry. Um, they don't take too long. Um, a, no, a number of them are inspired from uh, my life in Ireland. I lived there for nine years, and then some of them are inspired from living here in Wick Woodstock. So I'll just jump in. The first one is uh, Irish. It's called uh, <coughs> Gift of Life. The red flowers shimmer by the sea window as cold rain slashes the heavy gray air the hearth fire sends sparks onto the red wooden floor. Quickly, I stamp out the glowing embers, then scrape them up with the metal coal shovel, throwing them back into the roaring fire. Are the red embers a gift of life from the fire? Um, the next one is a poem that was inspired by living in Woodstock. Um, it's called Wild Geese. I lie in my warm bed thinking of my day ahead, not wanting to move from this cocoon of warmth, looking out my window into the early morning dark. I hear the wild geese call to one another their plain, their plaintive melancholy call. I cannot see them, but I can imagine what they look like in the sky, their V formation. Do you suppose they grieve leaving, flying south to avoid this season of cold snow and ice? Looking out my window, craning my neck this way and that, I look for them but I can't find them. I wish I could grow wings and go with them. Uh, this is another Woodstock poem called Beauty. The sky was dull and gray, the fields barren, gray and brown. I watched it snow yesterday covering the branches and ground, white. Waited to feel the storm, waited to feel the quiet, but I didn't feel the change. It was just snow, nothing magical, no experience of the infinite number of snowflakes with infinite numbers of shapes and sizes. I was unmoved. I assured myself each storm has its own personality. I am still waiting for beauty. This is an Irish poem. Uh, a friend of mine had cats, barn cats, and she was going to drown them, which they do in Ireland because that's just how it is. And so I adopted her, and she was just before Christmas, so we called her Noel, and she was pure black, and she... She had her own personality. She was the first time I'd ever owned a cat. I'd always owned dogs. The black cat, Noelle, opened her teeth and dropped the small bird on the back doormat at my feet. It lay there listless with its neck snapped. I thanked her for her wonderful gift, but explained that she didn't need to hunt for me. One day she coaxed me into watching her hunt in our back garden. Poised to pounce, stock still, she watched her prey with such intensity, turned to look at me as if to say, are you paying attention? Life takes patience. This is the last poem. It's called, um, this is an Irish poem also. It's called My Garden. 
I am watching the apple, cranberry, pear, cherry, and fig trees watching their fruit ripen. Last year I had big fat green figs that turned a deep purple on my windowsill. The apples are still too tart, the tree being only two years old. The pear tree doesn't get enough sun, so there's only one. The crab apples are yielding a good crop for jelly. The cherry tree is heavily laden with ripe red cherries. My mouth waters. I am sorely tempted, but I promise the fruit to the birds. Thanks. Gavin Wincoop Fisher. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, I'm happy to go because I, uh, I know, I've just tried to memorize this poem over the last couple of days and I gotta, gotta get it off my chest because I think I'm gonna mess it up and it's making, uh, I've got nerves. So, um, thanks for everyone that showed up. Um, um, yeah, this poem is about drones, and uh, when I was first writing it, Mason asked me about what I wrote about, and I said drones, and I don't know if this is what you expected, but this is what it is. Sometimes looking down looks a little like love, because sometimes drones fly to new snare of beauty from above to show you where you came from and what you're made of. The lands you bled and bleed upon. Yes, drones can tell us about our lives and belie how far we think we've come. Hovering like a lucid dream, lullaby, numb-lipped, hummed. But sometimes, the bird's eye view is a vulture watching you. In grim pursuit, looking down a deadly nose cone. Darkly scanning in different, different distance. And vision blur blender the genocide into breathtaking geographies to be consumed greedily by the great pale we, the culturalist catalog equipped extended magazine, extended warranties waving, French vanilla flat wipes, wife, fl French vanilla flat white Stepford wife target shopping skinny jean army jungles burning Amazon boxes stacked smirking as they apparate below stalwart front porch cams in the land of hormone laced milk and bless your heart honey invisible money still bloody invisible bands the divisible land of Instagrams and gasping grammar abandoned grandmothers chemical ecstasy by the gram like damn put a whole holy experience between my perfectly orchestrated teeth professionals curating smiles for the next level glass ceiling generational poverty versus heirloom opportunity Nepotism elevator flex sexy fanged families, plastic wrapped and grinning dumbly from behind designer frames, but their loveless eyes exclaim plainly, stay in your lane or be escalade flattened in these suburban streets with no sidewalks, because only poor folks walk or need communities, but not we. Not generation selfie, TikTok flossing on your grave en masse, laser off the fat, Snapchat filter a thousand degrees removed from the children we've allowed to be killed in the name of diamonds, in the name of martyrs, names we won't be bothered to pronounce or repeat, in the name of privileged poetry, in the name of in the holy, unholy spirit of my excess is your oppression. Under the pulpit of, you can't afford these blessings. In the gallery of, ring art from the blood of your sufferings. And maybe then we will make you famous. But we prefer if you were dead first, head first in your abyss, drown in the juice. Forget that world. After all, it's too below our own, and bronze won't buy back all those precious metals. Just weeds to a meadow, population backdrop. Bleeding heart, documentary status, like not on my Netflix, nicks all that sad shit. But the truth is still this. 
these far flung on the spectrum of breezes, these worrying metal feathers are borne up on a chorus of last breaths. What we pass off as pastimes blur lifelines and rain death. Sorry, that was terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah. Um, this is probably the first, one of the first poems I wrote. Um, it's pretty short, and um, it's about living outside my values. Sometimes it's hard to think on my sins when I raised the wolf pup and I wrapped him in skin. The bars were all fear, the dark always wins. But I gave him the night, and I lent him my grin. This one is, um, we're going to go up now. Um, this one's about attraction or chemistry. I wasn't exactly surprised to perceive the tiny tracings. Like fingerprints of lightning etched over her thighs, I'd already seen its flicker behind her eyes shine. Like celestial flash bulbs saturating Svalbard ice flows like she knows so much that I don't. As if some fresh Norse myth cracked the strata cumulus, gathered her dust rains and ions in, stuffed her electric pockets full, and finally inpinned her unruly halo with fresh nicked slivers of sunshine, and adorned just so she divined her decline, danced down clouds collapsing around, tiptoe twirling on effervescent treads past haphazard crackling threads like vicious blue stitches in the roiling black belly of the sky till the storm subsided and she stood stone still like a plasma hewn marble masterpiece radiating invisible vibrations in the corner of the kitchen lazily buzzing excitement into every electron engaged by her gaze but me i'm frozen puzzled to discover the lack of cold in her shoulders as the particles frenzy and scatter in little puffs of elation and the air it was emptied between us and with conviction that comes from raindrop drums and thunderhead tongues she sings says so slowly I see you, and I believe that's true. And I do one more? I'm gonna do one more because uh, there's a lot of people that I love in this room, and um, I like to do this one for the people I love, and uh, and I like to do it for myself because this poem is about intention. I want to be the bird song outside your window sill as the sun rises. Hot coffee in your cup, smiley face pancakes, or sunny side ups. A love note in your lunch box, hot socks right out of the dryer. I want to be the flowers gracing your path always, and the busy pollinators. Fruit off the tree, blood orange pulp between your teeth. The right words when the time is ripe. A seed planted in your mind just needs to breathe, plus a little sunshine. Reasons to toss back your head and laugh into the sky. I want to be like a decadent chocolate tort to your tongue. The blissful expression of divine satisfaction, the furrow melting from your brow. I want to be in your corner for the hardest fights. Salve to your wounds, sentinel through the nights. Want to be the footsteps coming down the hall when you finally fought through the lump in your throat to throw your little voice into the dark. I want to be your nightmare's bad day. A kiss on the head tucked into your chin, maker of safe beds. Want to be hot soup and a good read when it's drizzly gray, the kind that simmers perfect in your synapse as you close the last page. I want to be a shirt sleeve's mercy, all snot stains and saline, the welcome weight of a best friend's arm draped at your waist or over your shoulders, repeating you are worthy over and over. 
I want to be the kind of hug that leaves no room for insecurities. Like the next time you see me, there is no doubt that I'll squeeze out all that extra empty. Because I want to live lit like a spark in your chest cavity. And I want to hold you to your balance like gravity. I want to be allied by your side, or at very least on the far side of the line, attentively listening. Warm evening breeze, Gulf Stream palm trees. The one who showed you 100 innocent ways to love somebody. The butterflies in your belly because they already know you've just turned the corner, you're on the road home. Want to be the porch light on, a familiar silhouette in the egg yolk glow kitchen window as the evening sun sets. Want to be wordless understanding, a twinkle traversing irises across a crowd, a pun so bad you just had to laugh, another sun pushing through your clouds. Want to be your adorable dimples, the happy you can't fake. The smell of the waking day, the cascading in of warm recollections. River splash, heat relief, a heart-shaped stone. Fish on your line, sentimental cricket buzz, heart thrum of summertime. I want to be there in the morning to watch your waking eyes and deliver dawn's first laugh from your lungs. I want to be the hard-working farmer to your heart's every acre, bundle of joy, bouncing baby boy. I want to be your daymaker. Oh. You're it again, forget. Just a little alert, uh, even though we got a lot of people, we're going to take a little break in about 10, 20 minutes, just for a few minutes. Do you have someone appointed? Yes, Judith. Judith. Judith, <coughs> Judith Taylor. Let's hear it for Judith Taylor. The Minotaur's Memoir. Uh, 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 and, 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 I, and, I, and in, and in, and in the beginning. Once upon a time, years ago, yesterday, soon and now, this story is born from bedrock below deep green currents, cradled by tide, until it floats free, crawls ashore, takes root in the vault of the earth, flowers and bears fruit. In this landscape of motion, scrolling along folded walls, Mountains, spooling ranges, rings, ringes, hidden, hidden and infinite. Not a maze, meaning to confound, no. Mirror, map, wheel, way of knowing. To enter is to return. The gate begins at the center, and the center spirals endlessly everywhere. King Minos never commissions, and Daedalus does not build. No, it is Pasiphae, Pasiphae, my mother, whose love compels her to create the sanctuary shaped by the contours of her womb to shelter me, her secret. No monstrous man-child does she deliver, no. A girl baby, a daughter, all the more terrible for my horns and breasts. Beneath a wild mane, bovine eyes bulge from my brute skull, my nose a furnace above lips unfit for speech, amber teeth, a shaggy beard shocks my chin, but no swollen wineskin sag between my thighs. No, below my belly, another gate, another coiled chamber. So I am hidden, I hide, and no one knows. I choose solitude here in the throbbing heart of the world. Through all the arcing hours of shadow and light, never idle, I comb the winding path, 
work that might be better left undone, welcoming as it does what would destroy the form I labor to define. But labor is my consolation when the despair of Gnosis drums down these halls, its citizens haunted by the void that is my presence. Their hunger feeds me, so I bellow, and I bellow to assure them I am here. My nostrils dazzle. I open my throat. My roar, a river of magma, pours through the passage, licks the iron bars, the metal glows, the gate buckles. The people of Gnosis cower in the dark corners of their lives, needing to believe there is a beast. Their cries shatter the clouds, rain down on Theseus in his temple fortress, summon him, his rage against his gods, his father himself. To return is to begin. We meet in the center and know one another. Our grief and desire, half mortal, half divine, Theseus embraces the fierce maiden, and I anoint him with shadows. Beneath a howling sky, the mob ravenous for spectacle. Still at my side, Theseus unsheathes his sword. I smear the blade with my own clotted tide and send him into the light, his weapon pinned against the sun. The hand of darkness rests on the spine of Gnosis. All the long voyage home, Theseus stares into shadows, heedless of the black sail, the wounded horizon. On Naxos, Ariadne sleeps, wound in dreams of release. And the children, the children, ah, my dear ones, still they come bearing wonder, sunlit perfume on their lip, limbs, their oiled hair. In the language of light, we sing the radiant constellations, mystery and knowing. I bow before them. I kneel, they clamber up my back, up my shoulders, up through the breathing nexus, the same portal that hurls Icarus to his fate. But these children, wingless, buoyed by a cadence ancient and new, pulsing through them, these children dance their way beyond the years, living their song into the world, this world, this world, here, and, and, and. Thank you. So a while ago, in greeting somebody at work, asking them how they were doing, their one-word answer of age, their tone behind it sort of startled me. And, or they said old. And the tone sort of portrayed this fear and as if they'd suddenly found themselves in this place of age that they had never expected before, which motivated a nice, light-hearted poem that I'm working on, uh, on um, death and religion, um, which I have to say is pretty brilliant and genius and wholly divinely inspired, but I completely forgot it. And so you'll have to wait till next time to hear it. Um, so I thought tonight I would read some other poets' ideas on the subject, followed by um, a couple of my own. Um, one of my favorite poets of all time is uh, Wallace Stevens. And I got, I was privileged enough to hear Helen Bendler um, 
do, who's probably one of the most brilliant scholars on Wallace Stevens, do a half hour talk on this poem called The Emperor of Ice Cream, which summarized is basically about a Cuban funeral in uh, the Key West where Stevens spent much of his time. The Emperor of Ice Cream. Call the roar of big cigars, the muscular one, and bid him whip in kitchen cups, concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they are used to wear, and let the boys bring flowers in last month's newspapers. Let be, be, finale of seam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Take from the dresser of deal, lacking the three glass knobs, that sheet on which she embroidered fantails once, and spread it so as to cover her face. If her horny feet protrude, they come to show how cold she is and dumb. Let the lamp affix its beam. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Another one of my favorite poets, and I think many of you might share this, is um, um, Emily Dickinson. Um, and a sh nice short one. Um, uh, growing up in a very conservative Christian home um, and having to go to church every Sunday, I really... Um, this number 236, according to Johnson's n numeration of her poems, is just my ideal of church. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at, at last, I'm going all along. Um, and then sort of the idea of mortality, James Wright, I think, if you've ever read him, I think sort of almost every poem that you read of his, you can sort of hear the suffering of the body. Um, and this one is a nice, another nice short one by him called The Jewel. There is this cave in the air behind my body that nobody's going to touch. A cloister, a silence, closing around a blossom of fire. When I stand upright in the wind, my bones turn to dark emeralds. Um, and then sort of a couple poems of my own to close with my own sort of thoughts on the subject. Um, the first one titled Remedial, Remedial Metaphysics. There are certain acts we blame on the recklessness of people who survived much longer than they should. Half naked in the joy of lingering, they're caught up in crude pantomimes of our envy of them. On occasion, children like to peer around telephone poles or from behind it, f f faded and musty curtains hoping to finally see something mothers normally would never allow them to see. That is, two old men, looking like portraits going to ruin, arguing the finer points of death. And then a sort of um, weird love poem that's um, sort of phrased as um, a method of worship titled Worship. I've fallen in love with a woman so beautiful. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I've discovered a new form of worship, but still need to find a way to involve the deaf and those with one side shorter than the other. The idea is for you to fold yourself as many times as you can until only your unfettered parts are showing. More primitive forms of this were practiced on the banks of industrial canals in poorly structured countries during birthdays and on the anniversaries of less tragic events by women who at the very end would pose suggestively in the light of their own reflections. In my only sermon, I preach that faith isn't just about making excuses for doing whatever we want, but to outdo all other religions three to one. Right now you are unimpressed, but someday I'll show you a child's rendering of what my God looks like. What I believe makes me love, like an overgrown forest at night. You are there, two mismatched amber eyes approaching from a distance. Thank you.
Linda Grant. Do you want to go again? No, thank you. You're not going to read it? I'm not sure. All right. Anne? Anne Bauer? Anne <laughs> Bauer. So I'm still mourning Toni Morrison. <clears throat> so I'm going to read two poems um, dedicated to Toni Morrison. <clears throat> the first is called Red Heart. And there's a little quotation from Beloved. <clears throat> he would keep the rest where it belonged in that tobacco tin buried in his chest where a red heart used to be, its lid rusted shut. So that's said by Paul D. in Toni Morrison's Beloved, if you know the novel. If you don't know the novel, you need to. <clears throat> the heart, that four-chambered box of blood and muscle, we say is our center of feeling, though science credits the brain. The heart pumps, yet sometimes feels rusted shut, crouches, moans, weight of history, crushing, iron bars, the hungry belly, a ceiling low and dark, weight of present, clutching apathy, despite knowledge, resolve, words. Surely something can pry off this layered crust, some touch, generosity, need, can oil the hinges, release the fears that close the box. <clears throat> and this is a poem I wrote quite a long time ago, but <clears throat> um, I think of Morrison's novel, Jazz, and so that, that, that not, not a poem, a novel, um, but it's about people going to the city and, and being enthralled by the city's music, the subway and, and the traffic and everything and, and getting into the life in a city. And my jazz is in the country. Road jazz. My boots shush and pad the dirt road, patches of ice, patches of snow, and past bare trees the farmer's tractor has left row upon row of concentric circles from haying his field where this morning's flurry caught in stubble paints the pattern. And further along, peeled of bark and full of holes, dead trees march with live, maples mostly, edging the road, easy access for tapping. But now, incessant rapping. I've been hearing, as I walk, grows louder and high up on one decrepit tree, a pileated woodpecker drums his search for insects or to make a shelter. Red-topped head and long beak in staccato, long beak and staccato beat that follows as I walk on, delight a rhythm in my blood. <clears throat> so I read that um, if you have an aging brain, as some of us here do, one of the best things you can do is write and write in full compound sentences. So I have written a poem that's just a compound sentence. <laughs> Ode to the compound sentence. While not a cure, the long curvaceous river of a thought explored in words well chosen, banked by grammar and punctuation, can irrigate the brain, perhaps hold back old age failing memory, and so I paddle along across this lined yellow pad, my one oar a green and white plastic pen, inking me onward, my evolving idea, both guiding star and rudder, mind free to wander but not aimless, Focused, seeking, shaping, connecting, and just as an oar leaves trails in the water, my pen leaves trails on the page. And like water swirling, then calming after boat's passage, my phrases will change, shaped anew by revision, or perhaps thrown away, wafting into air. And even if held in time, preserved in print, they'll swirl and settle anew when read by you. <laughs> so 
see, you got me started on the old thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my last poem. <clears throat> Grit. Why smolder over what's lost or stolen? A career, a love, friends seized by death, that diamond ring gone missing. Yet I mourn lost species, trashed neighborhoods, and those gruesomely gentrified, mourn once pristine rivers, chestnut trees, elms, green finery. All we can save is now, and with luck, ignite enough anger to fuel change. Breathe today's sorry air, spark our old bones for the work at hand. Thanks. I, I like to skip it right along. Yeah. Cole is next. Cole. Uh, Asude, right? Asude? Yeah. Cole Asude is next. <laughs> uh, Alright, these are some poems. Uh, I believe that's what I'm here to do. Uh, here's one that I wrote like four or five hours ago. We're all running into wood chippers, regrets, and I'm being dramatic again. I wish I could speak in song lyrics. World was on fire, no one could save me but you. All of us are uncool, lame, but not really, not you. Actually, about that, which is to say nothing, we have nothing. I'm diving head first into a wood chipper, spreading everything I thought was great about seeing you, and I'm being dramatic. But I'd never be able to forgive myself if I watched you walk away. This has it. Right. Writing. The scab I've picked so many times, there's no skin, just a crater. In it, I fashioned an identity, a being. Writing. What keeps me up at night makes me want to wake up every morning and is the scab I can't let heal. Writing. The one thing I can do well and not keep asking over and over, why do I do this? I know why. Because writing is the crater that fills in crevices, hollowing me out from the inside. Writing, the only thing that makes sense to a pissed off kid who can't understand how he inhabits a world where Vong, Didion, Kafka, Camus, King, Poe all pick the same scab. Writing, my life, my goal, the withdrawal for the next word, the crater sheltering me. Uh. All right. um, let's see. You're not supposed to end sentences with conjunctions. Conjunctions. Maybe you shouldn't go for that English degree. <laughs> You're not supposed to end sentences with conjunctions, but my mind is a Rubik's Cube with its stickers peeled off, and how do I express something like an emotion? I've never been the serious type, so when the occasion arises, I keep my fucking mouth shut. Or if I feel the compulsion, I'll rip out my heart, blood pouring into my hands, deep and rich, until I weaponize it, throwing to you. But if you catch it midair, maybe it'll work out, or it won't. I'll have drained my blood like a pig for nothing. Mm -hmm. So, all of this bullshit, creating violent friction, brain striking heart, logic igniting passion, what I mean to say is, I love you, but... <laughs> So hey, how are you? Hopefully well, or at least fine. Alive. Really alive. Not simply existing, but thriving in that big city. Art school. Painting. Portraits. And I guess that means that you might be painting yourself. And I, well, part of me wants to see your face or your painting. But you don't paint. Not anymore. To think that I know or knew you a fellow artist, creator, friend that I lost, gave up because my hands were bound myself. Because once I was fond of you, but you never owed me a second of your time. So I guess I mean to apologize for whatever it's worth. I'd love to see your art, or maybe you learned 
to play guitar like you wanted. Um, let's see, I got a couple more, if I can find them. Uh, I'll do this one next. The truth is just that, the truth. Nothing more, nothing less. And it's about as welcome as a cheese grater shredding the palm skin into ribbons. But it's a sin to lie, so says he. But truthfully, God to me is as welcome as barracudas in a kiddie pool or a hustler magazine reading at Chuck E. Cheese. Please, stop lying to me. Just tell your captive audience why you're so insistent on forcing entry into my life like a man with a crowbar, wedging opening a door like an incision. But I've made my decision not to call you. The truth is, I don't love, like, or tolerate you. We were never the real deal, and yet it feels like a divorce. However, the course of the year, I fell in love for someone I never knew. And that's the truth. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, I got a... yeah. I tried to do a Sistina, and then I realized how... Um, for lack of a better term, arbitrary, some of the rules are. Uh, so uh, this is what I made in between hitting my head against the wall of writing a Sistina. <laughs> I found my soul in a dimly flickering hotel light, insistent in its malfunctioning functionality. It stands as a beacon for rest, solace, but not to its full capacity. Once I nearly drowned in a mug, the acrid taste greeted me like a lover, tongue contemplating the bitter brew, warmth sinking to the bottom of my stomach with the steaming liquid enveloping me, I found my soul. The room was a tar pit, drinks sinking patrons in. I sat across someone whose laughs triggered involuntary smiles. It led me to some semblance of memory. Once I nearly drowned in a mug. Memories are films. Narratives violently converge. Scenes overlap, intertwine. In my bedroom, I stared at the ceiling, rationalizing my brain's avant-garde cinematography. The room was a tar pit. It's hard to gaze into the mirror of the past at a contorted face whose smile evokes nostalgia or a cocktail of happiness and longing. The reflection is ever-changing. Memories are films. There's a dim light flickering in the confines of my skull. The conscience is often mistaken for the soul, or was it the other way around? Of course, I'll never objectively know. It's hard to gaze into the mirror of the past. And then uh, one last poem. <sighs> is the sound level okay? Yeah. There's no reason not to yell, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm not half unhappy. I am fucking pissed, and you are going to hear every single word searing my brain as though it were thrown onto a bed of flaming hot coals. Do I, where do I start? Do I start with the person who indifferently shrugged at my poem they asked to read because I don't write like Frost? I don't romanticize nature. I already know it's beautiful because I fucking live in New Hampshire and spend every morning shoveling off my goddamn car. Or do I start with the dipshit who almost rammed into me because he doesn't understand the meaning of the word yield. Yield! I'd appreciate it. If I'm going to die, I'd like to choose how it happens. Thank you. Don't even get me started on the man making the rest of America look bad because he needs to prove to everyone just how big his balls are. And because of him and his big orange balls, we are one step closer to living in a nuclear winter wonderland. Now that is a frost poem I would love to read while skin is peeling off of my face like a banana. I'm sorry. I'm a little upset. I haven't had any coffee. and I haven't slept properly in a week. How have you been? Thank you. Kristen? Kristen misspelled. Hi. I have to um, write. It's the way I breathe. I've been doing it since I was 12. I will be 71 tomorrow. Thank you. I've seen it too, but I can't sing. So. <laughs> this was written 
some of my some of my poems are all my children. Um, some of them I don't like at all, and others are very very close to me. And they're they're small little things, and and I just love them so much. I love all my children. Um, this one was written for a woman who was dying of alcoholism and didn't want to die. And it was written in 1985 in Woodstock. To the world, I was drawn to you as a moth to a flame, and I danced in your light. But I never saw a reflection of beauty in your eyes, nor was I ever worn by that brilliant glow. I was never able to draw even a drop of water from you to begin to quench my thirst, nor was there ever any food off offering to sustain me, only that brilliant white light to dance in, as you drank of and as you fed on me. I dance for you no longer. She got sober a year later. This was back in 1987 in Woodstock. Peter brought me a weed that made a mess in my room today. And when he gave it to me, I knew it would die. So I put it on my windowsill and waited. It was snowed on, shined on, rained on, blown on, and it grew and grew. Today I opened my window and mist of angel's breath, the essence of wood fairy's aura, of love not tacked down, cloud-like spiraling wind babies blue all over my room and I thank God for yet another day. Uh, I had one more I was going to read. I think. Oh, I skipped that. Yes, this was also done in Woodstock waiting in line at the um, drive through in the ba at the bank in 1987. My life is an elephant and sometimes it sits on me. It has the nature of a beast and sometimes it gallantly carries me to and fro as a chosen one from the king's palace amidst the peasantry with jingle jangle brass bells and tapestries woven of gold and silk. But sometimes it sits on me. Today it did. Thank you for inviting me to be here, Gavin. I was reading uh, over the past week a collection of short stories by James Thurber. And uh, James Thurber, in a couple of those stories, um, went, a went after Gertrude Stein a little bit. And I know who Gertrude Stein was, you know, she influenced Hemingway. She said, rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. Um, but I didn't know an awful lot more about her. so. I found a couple of her poems and I read them. And <clears throat> this one is called Sacred Emily. I'm going to read just the first 10 lines or so. OK, that was, that was just the first 10 lines. Um, <laughs> I, I won't read the rest of it to you because I think that gives you a pretty good idea <laughs> of what, what she had to say. <laughs> and she inspired me <clears throat> to write this on Gertrude Stein. Gertrude, Gertrude, I'm spending too much time with you. Did I put in 60 years of working life, earning the leisure to do what I want with my time, to read what I want, when I want, and then find myself struggling with poetry you wrote because I find it impenetrable? <laughs> I get as much from closing my copy of Sacred Emily in my desk drawer and trying to decipher it through the desktop as I do when I put it on the desktop and read the words. Gertrude, Gertrude, if I were to write as you did 367 incoherent lines of poetry would there be some learned person 
who would read it and say, to dismiss his work as unintelligible is to refuse to put in the effort to understand it. As one said of yours, that would worry me because what if it's not that I haven't put in the time, but that I'm simply not capable? I suspect that if I heard the person say that about my poetry and the effort it requires, I might laugh as perhaps you did and think as perhaps you did, he doesn't get it. <laughs> Gertrude, Gertrude, if I were to write, as you did, 367 incoherent lines of poetry, would there be some learned person who would say, his work is unreadable, of no intellectual value and not worth the time to read, as one said of yours? That would reassure me, because I have put in the time, but I have come up with nothing of value. I suspect that if I heard the person say that about my poetry and its absence of value, I might laugh as perhaps you did and think as perhaps you did, okay, you got me. <laughs> Gertrude, Gertrude, genius they say you were, and no genius I, but still I believe I hear you laughing at the unworldly who don't get your elaborate joke and at the equally unworldly who think they do. I hear you laughing happy either way. I see you reading my complaint about the time and effort I've put in trying to understand what can be interpreted but still not understood only to find that it's either not worth the effort or that I'm simply not capable. Gertrude, Gertrude, I hear you laughing even harder. So I will actually read uh, one of her poems. This is called Pigeons on the Grass, Alas. Pigeons on the Grass, Alas. Pigeons on the grass, alas. Short, longer grass, short, longer, longer, shorter, yellow grass, pigeons. Large pigeons on the shorter, longer, yellow grass, alas, pigeons on the grass. If they were not pigeons, what were they? If they were not pigeons on the grass, alas, what were they? He had heard of a third, and he asked about if it was a magpie in the sky. If a magpie in the sky on the sky cannot cry, if the pigeon on the grass, alas, can, alas, and to pass the pigeon on the grass, alas, and the magpie in the sky on the sky, and to try and to try, alas, on the grass, alas, the pigeon on the grass, the pigeon on the grass, and alas, they might be very well, they might be very well, very well they might be. Let Lucy, Lily, Lily, Lucy, Lucy, let Lucy, Lucy, Lily, 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 let Lily, Lucy, Lucy, let Lily, let Lucy, Lily. Well, you're laughing at Gertrude Stein. <laughs> so what I took from that was that if she can write something like that, then I can write something like this, which I did quite a few years ago, and I call it, It's So Clear Second. I am you, are me, I am you, are. I am you, are me, you are, I am. I am not I, I am you, are not you. You are not, I am not you, you are not, we are you. You are we are not, I am not we. We are not, you are not, I. I am you, are we, are we. And I actually meant something by that. <laughs> but I don't have to explain it to you. And if you don't put in the time to understand it, then the hell with you. A friend of mine sent me a postcard 
some years ago from Carcassonne. And I remembered being there in Carcassonne, and then I remembered when it was that I was there in Carcassonne. So I wrote this poem. I climbed the worn and gritty steps to walk the walls of Carcassonne on a summer afternoon in the year you were born. I tried to imagine the thousand years those massive walls had stood as I walked through time and a butterfly led me skipping across the work of forgotten hands. I called on the ghosts of lifetimes lived here long before mine as I looked through the embrasures at empty fields below, but no besieging army appeared in the stillness and the heat of the drowsing old city in the year you were born. I threw a masonry fragment over the wall and it disappeared into a moment in my life. I left there the fragment and the scrape of my footsteps and my breath and the handful of dust I blew swirling into the air. Did you find them there? I left them for you. President George W. Bush declared safe boating day sometime back during his administration. And it reminded me of a, an experience I had out on the water. I wrote a poem about it. If you take a boat out on the water on a July night when there's no moon and no stars, if you do that because you like to be out there at night when nobody else ever is, if you like the way the boat feels moving through the water and there's nothing to see except the phosphorescence of your wake and the only thing you hear is the splash of the oars and the skittering sound they make as you feather them on each stroke, if you get caught up in a kind of reverie and you don't realize how far you've traveled and you don't realize that you are headed straight for Judge Simmel's dock and you only have a second to register the fact that the quality of the sound has changed before you are actually under the dock, <laughs> precisely midway between the pilings at its outer end. And your oars hit the pilings with a shocking crack and they leap out of your hands as they pivot in their locks and hit you in the stomach with so much force that they knock you backwards off the seat and knock the wind out of you and leave you lying flat on your back while the boat slowly and silently drifts the rest of the way under the dock and fetches up against the bulkhead with a soft thump and you hear a sliding sound in two splashes as your oars slide out of their locks and begin to drift away and your diaphragm slowly recovers from its shock-induced paralysis and allows you to manage small sips of air and then very gradually larger ones as you look up and begin to think Am I under a dock? <clears throat> if you do that, you're not practicing safe boating. <laughs> Meg, you want to go next? Uh, sure. Meg Brazil. Meg Brazil. Well, I forgot everything this morning. I didn't have enough coffee. I didn't have enough sleep. Didn't bring my notebook. Haven't got any new poems. Kind of depressed listening to all this great poetry tonight. I was thinking about just waiting another month, but I was looking at this book earlier. Sometimes I do that in a little bit of a panic before recite as to whether I want to read something or not, my own poem or something else. Anyway, this is an anthology that Billy Collins put together ages ago. And it's kind of a nice, simple one we have here at the library that I feel like it's easy to find things 
in here that I like. So I'm going to read two poems. Um, oh, and I must say, if you aren't already submitting your work to places to be published, I really hope that you will because there's just some amazing work I've heard tonight. Okay, this is by, and you know, here I am in one of these quandaries. I'm not even sure how to pronounce the poet's name. You know how there's like these words that you've said, you know, a hundred times, and you realize, oh, to myself, I've never said it aloud. So I'm not sure if it's Charles Simic? Simic. Okay. Very well done. Country Fair by Charles Simic. If you didn't see the six-legged dog, it doesn't matter. We did, and he mostly lay in the corner. As for the extra legs, one got used to them quickly and thought of other things, like what a cold, dark night to be out at the fair. Then the keeper threw a stick, and the dog went after it, on four legs, the other two flapping behind, which made one girl shriek with laughter. She was drunk, and so was the man who kept kissing her neck. The dog got the stick and looked back at us, and that was the whole show. So, as you probably all know, it's winter in Vermont, and it goes on a really long time. And in November, someone invited me to go to Hawaii, and they were going to pay for it. And I was like, my God, no one has, I mean, I almost choke up. No one has ever offered to pay for a trip like that for me. And I really wanted to go. But I said, no, thank you, I'm not going. And the reasons for that are kind of simple and a little complicated, and I'm not going to tell you about them. <laughs> <laughs> but amazingly, when I opened this book, which is part of the reason I decided to read tonight, was I saw this poem called, I'm Not Flying to Hawaii, <laughs> which has pretty much nothing to do with why I didn't go to Hawaii. Um, so it's called, I'm Not Flying to Hawaii by Allison Luderman. I could be the waitress in the airport restaurant, full of tired cigarette smoke and unseeing tourists. I could turn into the never noticed landscape hanging identically in all the booths, or the customer behind the Chronicle who's been giving advice about stock portfolios for 40 years. I could be his mortal weariness, his discarded sports section, his smoldering ashtray. I could be the 70-year-old woman who has never seen Hawaii, touching her red lipstick and sprayed hair. I could enter the linen dress that poofs around her body like a bridesmaid, or become her gay son sitting opposite her, stirring another sugar into his coffee for lack of something true to say. I could be the reincarnated soul of the composer of the Muzak that plays relentlessly overhead or the factory worker who wove this fake oriental carpet or the hushed shoes of the busboy. But I don't want to be the life of anything in this pit stop. I want to go to Hawaii, the wet, hot, impossible place in my heart that knows just what it desires. I want money. I want candy. I want sweet ukulele music and birds who drop from the sky. I want to be the volcano who lavishes her boiling rock soup love on everyone. And I want to be the lover of volcanoes who loves best what burns her as it flows. P.S. I went to St. Martin's. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Gertrude Stein lived with Alice Toklas, and Alice Toklas made those brownies, which explains everything, <laughs> I think. Um, 
I think my poetry, a lot of what I'm writing comes from recollections. I'm sure that's true for all of us. And some of my strongest recollect recollections are uh, moments of my childhood, especially my, my teenage years. And the poems I chose tonight are sort of a celebration of that and another event that took place 61 years ago yesterday, which was um, immortalized in Don McLean's song, um, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. So um, on February 3rd, 1959, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper, and their pilot, Roger Peterson, died in a tragic plane crash in, in Iowa. And um, these three poems sort of harken to that time in my life, and two of them more specifically than the other. Uh, and there are some cryptic things in here that maybe I should explain in advance. The 45 that I'm talking about is a 45 record, not a 45 revolver. <laughs> and the coral um, that is yellow as orange is, is not a reef, it's the, the label. To Buddy, I was a teenager in love in the winter of 59. When I came home from school that day, Jimmy C came down to the basement where we listened to the stand-up Magnavox with the enormous dial that glowed amber. This is what we did where I lived back then when rock and roll was born. And Jimmy didn't have to tell me what happened because Alan Freed was playing one right after the next on WINS. But that's why we came down here after school. So we sat and we listened. Words of love, whisper soft and true, hold me close, tell me how you feel, tell me love is real. I held Peggy Sue in my hand, a 45, coral, yellowish orange. Every day was the flip side. Every day seems a little longer. Every day loves a little stronger. I wanted so much to be with my girl right then. She would need me to hold her tight because I'm going to need my baby tonight. In the background, between songs, there was talk, a small plain, a snowy field. But the fact is that Jimmy and I just couldn't take it all in. It was too much back then when we were teenagers, and there were so many possibilities. But now, 50 years later, my heart is wide open, and it feels good to be quiet and listen to the music again and remember the day it fell from the sky. So that was one. Um, Chuck and I have been friends for a long time, and we both have this wonderful affair with old rock and roll. And um, 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, we met at the Prince and the Pauper, a group of us, to, um, to talk about that event that happened back in 1959. So that poem is 11 years old. And um, last year, at 60, I wrote another one for Buddy on, to celebrate this, uh, to celebrate him and his music and rock and roll that was going on back then. So this one's called At 60. For so many years, I have marked the day and I close my eyes to see the faded photo, black and white, the cornfield strewn with rubble and broken stalks. It mystifies the eye, that long rutted, dark harrow, the road to eternity, gouged in the snow. I pause, a sweet refrain rises, and I strain to listen, torn between sound and sight, the tormented image, the echoing refrain growing and flowing across the field, out to the dawn horizon, echoing across the plain, across the country, around the world, a melody, a beat, on and on, shuffling in time, a slap, a clap, the snap of fingers, the strain of strings, a voice so sweet, it will never die. And the last one, um, 
also a tribute to the music of uh, the early rock and roll days called A Morning in Memphis. One endless night we played old 45s until the sun came up in Memphis. And another day stretched out on the uh, another day stretched out flat and brilliant lighting up everything on its journey across the wide rivers and the slumbering mountains past crystal cities under violet skies. It was all in the future and we listened in silence. But before I fell asleep I said Tonight we went back so far, I think we have found home together among these incredible notes. All of this is so new, you said. It's okay, I said, spin another. And I think I'm gonna really like growing up with you. Thank you. And thank you for all the great poetry tonight. Linda Grant. Hi, everybody. I'm actually going to start with something a bit harsh, but I feel uh, compelled to read this. And thank you for being my audience. It's a poem by Lawrence Ferlinghetti called Pity the Nation. Pity the nation whose people are sheep and whose shepherds mislead them. Pity the nation whose leaders are liars, whose sages are silenced, and whose bigots haunt the airwaves. Pity the nation that raises not its voice except to praise conquerors and acclaim the bully as hero, and aims to rule the world by force and by torture. Pity the nation that knows no other language but its own and no other culture but its own. Pity the nation whose breath is money and sleeps the sleep of the too well fed. Pity the nation, oh, pity the people who allow their rights to erode and their freedoms to be washed away. My country tears of the sweet land of liberty. That was written in 2007, I believe. And he's still alive and living, and living in New York City, I understand. And this is a poem quite the opposite. It's about hope. And it's written by a wonderful friend of mine who's no longer with us. Um, but she wrote it um, actually in a classroom or a, when she should have been taking a test, but wrote this instead of answering the question that they were to write about. It's called A New Beginning. A new beginning, a chance for winning a future, done the past. The final end of backward trend, a goal to reach at last. A fresh desire, a new lit fire, the will to forge ahead. The past despair is gone, and there remains a hope instead. And she got an A. <laughs> um, I'm just going to take a sip of water. Emily Dickinson has been spoken of tonight. And I was afraid someone was going to read this poem that I particularly like. Excuse me. But there are two things about it that to mention first. It will give away the title of the poem, but do people here know what a tippet made of tulle is? I didn't, <laughs> so I looked Something it up. Goes around your shoulders, right? That's yeah. right. It's an old-fashioned shawl that women wore, and the tippet is the shawl made of tulle, 
is a, almost a gossamer-like fabric that it is made from. And secondly, some might say that this should be read by a man because a man wrote it, Billy Collins. But the delicacy of the subject appeals to me, so I'll give it a try. And someday I'd love to hear a man read it. I have it memorized. You do? Yeah. So I'll say it with you. No, you, <laughs> no, you go, I want Stealing to you. my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> It's called Taking Off Emily Dickinson's Clothes. First, her tippet made of tulle, easily lifted off her shoulders and laid on the back of a wooden chair. And her bonnet, the bow undone with a light forward pull. Then the long white dress a more complicated matter with mother of pearl buttons down the back, so tiny and numerous that it takes forever before my hands can part the fabric like a swimmer's dividing water and slip inside. You will want to know that she was standing by an open window in an upstairs bedroom, motionless, a little wide-eyed, looking out at the orchard below, the white dress puddled at her feet on the wide-board hardwood floor. The complexity of women's undergarments in 19th century America is not to be waved off, and I proceeded like a polar explorer through clips clasps and moorings, catches, straps, and whalebone stays, sailing toward the iceberg of her nakedness. Later, I wrote in a notebook, it was like riding a swan into the night. But of course, I, I cannot tell you everything. The way she closed her eyes to the orchid, how her hair tumbled free of its pins, how there were sudden dashes whenever we spoke. What I can tell you is it was terribly quiet in Amherst that Sabbath afternoon. Nothing but a carriage passing the house, a fly buzzing in a window pane, so I could plainly hear her inhale when I undid the very top hook and eye fastener of her corset. And I could hear her sigh when it finally was unloosed, the way some readers sigh when they realize that hope has feathers, that reason is a plank, that life is a loaded gun that looks right at you with a yellow eye. Lily Collins taking off Emily's clothes. And who's the color? Uh, Billy Collins, yes. Um, I wrote the next poem. Um, but first, I need to ask another question of you all. Some of you here, I know, are old enough to remember when your mother wore an apron or your grandmother wore an apron. Other of, of you may not have a relative that you saw in an apron, but aprons were pretty wonderful for a number of, of causes or uses, I mean. Um, they were great if they were made of the same fabric as the dress because women didn't have a lot of dresses and they could wash the apron much more easily than they could have their dress washed. But aprons were great for drying kids' tears. They were great for cleaning out dirty ears. 
They were used for carrying eggs from the chicken coop. When company came and little shy kids were afraid, they hid behind the apron that their mother or grandmother was wearing. You can imagine, I mean, there are all sorts of uses, whether it's um, vegetables from the garden or kindling and chips that were brought in from the wood bin, apples in the fall that had fallen on the ground. At any rate, um, maybe one looked something like this. And I have several that were given to me, um, handed down from my grandmother to my mother and to me. At any rate, it inspired me to write a poem. And you'll understand how the apron fits in when I finish it. Her words last sweetly in my ears, though sadly my memory of her face has faded. This, just one of many tidbits of keepsake teachings I treasure and mind from those days gone by. Advice spoken in a busy kitchen in the house where my mother was raised. The room, a spacious place of tempting scents where Nana and great Aunt Bessie baked and stirred, peeled and boiled, hearty meals for their hungry nine. Though it was rare to see them occupied, two rocking chairs flanked the deep fireplace where hanging kettles and seasoned pots bubbled and brimmed with stews and chowders. Time to rest was in short supply, so when at last she might steal one half hour, Nana, with seriousness usually reserved for stronger admonitions, would teach my mother to never nap without at least some light layer over her. Even Clara, if it's only your apron. And I don't know, maybe that's probably all we have time for this evening. I'm not looking at the clock for um, Well, I'll read this one more. Okay. And this is by Mary Oliver. And gosh, I, I took it from the Times the New York Times, in 1969, this appears. It's called Time Passing. Time rounds again to another autumn. And is it true as it seems each year the trees die brighter? Apples release on the tongue a more pungent taste? Cows in wide meadows or gathered by barns at dusk learn more and more how to arrange themselves like Wyeth paintings, it seems. Or is it merely time's last gleam on things so lately young? Promises, dreams, the men we meant to be and have not been that sharpens the rough fall. Whatever it is, the hurt sinks deeper in each year as the trees give up their leaves, the better to endure, and the cooling hills clasp their seeds fast as they stare into space. Whatever has happened, it is fall now, not spring, that seems the familiar place. Thank you. I'm going to read just one, but I'm going to give you a copy of it. Well, uh, I thought I would give you a copy of it. I thought, well, I'll be generous. I'll make 12 copies. And I think we have more than 12 people. But so uh, some of you may want, might want to share. But um, I'll pass it around. Yes. 
Oh, I think there's two of these. So let me get one back here. Bob, let's see how we're doing here. I got one right here. That's a good one. This this was in, was inspired by. I got I got X tree. For some reason. Let's see, do I need myself one? Uh, one more. Anybody want one? Okay. Um, a few weeks ago on uh, Vermont Public Radio, on the Sunday evening program at six o'clock, they have uh, says says you. It's a word program, and from time to they had one on poet. They'd read a line of poetry, and the, the question person would have to say what the next line was, or what the line was before it and who the poet was. And so that was one of the inspirations. The other one was, I kept saying, you know, I'm, I don't know. I want to do something with a metaphor. So the metaphor idea is the left kneecap, and I call it an assignable metaphor with allusions to poetry. So I'm going to read it through, and then I'm going to have a little quiz. We're going to see if we recognize the poems, and maybe, you know, we. Someone can re recite part of the poem, or and who the poet is. Okay, my left kneecap. Oh, go ahead, recite your poems to me, while I sit in silence, suffering intense pain in my left kneecap. If only you'd listen to me for a change, you might learn about real life rather than ramble on about when life is too much like a pathless world. Do you want to come in? I have an extra sheet for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I was going to tell you about my venture of which, of how I wrenched my left kneecap, but no, you'd rather enjoy thinking about how hilarious it must have been to watch Farmer Brown's lantern-lit icy descent. I guess you'd rather celebrate yourself than enter into the pain of a real life that has nothing to sing or celebrate. After all, my body is not electric. I know you'd rather be meditating on a flock of swans on a pond in October just before they migrate rather than listening for a few moments about how difficult it is for me to navigate due to the pain in my left kneecap. I was hoping you'd think of offering to make me a cup of hot tea to ease the pain in my left kneecap, but it's too much to expect when you are thinking about how malt can do more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. I'd like to walk down to the place where John's been cutting trees to see the, to see the birch he said I could have if it weren't for the pain in my left kneecap. Anyway, You'd probably prefer to go alone, to wander lonely as a cloud. I'm sorry to bore you with my little troubles, even if my le left kneecap is aching. Since we've been friends all these years, you will know that I am the self-consumer of my woes. <coughs> OK, back to the first stanza, when life is too much like a pathless wood. Yes, What's that? Frosty. You sound very frosty. Too. I, I frosty. Would say frosty. frosty. Yeah. Do you know the next line? No, I can make one up. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Does anybody know the next line or the line before it? When life is too much like a path with wood and a cobweb, your face burns and tickles from a, with a cobweb having broken across it. Yeah. Okay. Let's. What's that? Oh, who's the poet? Frost. Frost, Frost. Okay, yeah. And then the next one, how hilarious it must have been to watch Farmer Brown's lantern lit icy descent. Who's that? Would you guess Frost again? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Farmer Brown's descent. Yeah. It's in January. It's a January poem. Beautiful poem about Farmer Brown sliding down the... Okay. Next... next um, Stanza, 
I guess you'd rather celebrate yourself. Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman. After all, my body is not electric. Whitman. Whitman, yeah. So, And the next stanza, what's the allusion there? Must be Yeats. What, yes. What, do you know the... Yeah. Um, the swans... Uh, um, oh, cool. Uh, like, yeah. Swans are cool. Uh, let's see, how's it going? Uh, the trees are in their autumn beauty. The woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors the still sky. Among the... Yeah, among the... Brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. The 19th autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw before I'd well finished, I'll suddenly mount and scatter, wheeling in great broken rings upon the clamorous wings. I won't go any further. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, Malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. Oh. Who? Oh. No. A.E. Houseman. 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 Oh, from Chuck Sheerlion. Well, there's more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. <laughs> Ale, man. Ale's the stuff to drink for fellows whom it hurts to think. Look into the pewter pot to see the world as the world's not. Oh, yeah. Faith is pleasant till tis past. Just mischief fears till not last. Oh, I bend to little fair and left my necktie God knows where <laughs> and carried halfway home or near. Pints and quarts of Ludlow beer. Then the world seemed none so bad, and I myself a sterling lad. And down in lovely muck I've lain, happy till I woke again. That's part of it. Okay. Next, next stanza. I'd like to go down to the place where John's been cutting trees to see the birch he said I could have. Frost. What? Frost again. Frost again. And what's the next line after that? Was it the swingers of the, the, the swingers of birches or the No, no. Um, we already had that, because uh, uh, birches is in the pathless wood. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, this is the uh, pea bush, or pre yeah, pea bushes, or pea brush. It's because uh, it says, he said I could have to bush my peas. The sun the new, ma new made narrow gap was hot enough for the first of May, and stifling hot with the odor of sap from stumps still bleeding their life away. Okay. And then to go alone, to wander Wordsworth. lonely as a cloud. Wordsworth. Wordsworth. Yes. 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 You may, anybody want to say part of it? No, are we, is it Wordsworth? Okay. It is Wordsworth, yeah. yeah. To wander lonely it's as a cloud. Hills. That floats on high or veils and hills. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He didn't give us an affirmation there. We thought. Yeah. Okay. We the wrong guy. I'm deaf. <laughs> okay. In the last um, stanza, I am the self-consumer of my woes. This is one of my favorite, favorite poems. It's autobiographical too. Early boy, British. He wrote this poem when he spent the last third of his life in an insane asylum. Wonderful poet. So if you go to the insane asylum, that's what you're supposed to do. What's that? No. John Claire. John Clare. Who said it? It's good. I am yet what I am, none cares or knows. My friends forsake me like a memory lost. I am the self consumer of my woes. They rise and vanish in oblivious hosts, like shadows and love's frenzy stifled throat, and yet I am and live like vapors tossed into the nothingness of scorn and noise, into the living sea of waking, waking dreams where there is neither sense, no life, no joy, but the vast shipwreck of my life's esteem. Even the dearest that I love the best are strange, nay, rather stranger than the rest. I long for scenes where man has never trod, a place where woman never smiled nor wept, there to abide with my creator God and sleep as I in childhood sweetly slept. Untroubling and untroubled where I lie, the grass below, above the vaulted sky. Thank you. Richard, you, you, you can have a, uh, a 
a new game show on VPR. What's that? You could host a new game show on VPR <laughs> based on this. Oh, you think so? I think yeah. you could. It'd be fun to do. Yeah, well, well, you know, what I was going to say is, Billy Collins was mentioned, and he said if you if, if you get a poem or you read a poem and you don't like it, use it as a prompt to write a new one. So all of you that have a copy of the poem, write a new one, and when we see you in April, you Sorry, can read it. Assignment. That's your assignment. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. It's here for Richard. We'll see you in April. <laughs> Very quickly. Um, Thank you, Macy, for recording us for posterity, for better or worse. You can see this on local TV or YouTube when it arrives. Uh, and then, as we always say, thanks for listening. And uh, in the best sense of any kind of groups, keep coming back if you feel like. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh,